Hi. Um, well, today is day mm -hmm, of the quarantine. <laughs> um, and this is our second installment of KGM Connects. And we have two fantastic casting directors joining us today. Uh, may I have uh, Daryl, you introduce, and then we'll switch over? Sure. Hi, I'm Daryl Eisenberg uh, from Eisenberg Beans Casting. I am currently holed up in my closet in Watching, New Jersey, practicing safe social distancing. Woo! Do I go now? Yes, please. <laughs> Hi, I'm Allie Beans, comma CSA, holed up in my bedroom in Dallas, Texas with two dogs. Sorry if you hear them. They are welcomed additions. Yeah. And Daniel and Rob, who are you? I'm currently just outside our nation's capital. And I'm here in Westfield, New Jersey, not too far from Daryl. Oh. In my You're childhood bedroom with some fun posters. Well, guys, I'm so glad we're all here. Yep. So a few quick uh, house cleaning notes uh, as we go through this. We expect this will be a 20 to 30 minute conversation. Um, obviously, there's a lot going on in the world right now. So I think we'll sort of both obviously address what we're all going through head on and, and why we're here. Uh, and then Daryl and Allie, I think we also have some just things we want to talk to you about, about casting directors in the business of live theater. Um, two quick things. One, if you want to interact with us, uh, there's a little chat window here, uh, or you could pop it up on your screen there. Feel free to ask us any questions. We'll try to periodically drop in there uh, and see what you guys are asking. Or we're trying a little experiment today. Um, you can hashtag your question to us on Twitter, ask KGM Connects. Great. So guys, first of all, just, you know, I, I think we just should address everything head on. We are, as Margaret said, we're all quarantined right now. Theater is shut down. You two obviously are used to going to casting sessions all day long um, and working with producers and being in close proximity with actors. Besides the obvious, or maybe just the obvious, how has this changed your lives? Daryl, do you want to go? <laughs> sure. Um, I'd say for the portion of our lives where we are in the live audition room, sure, things are very different. Um, we haven't had auditions. Uh, we were meant to have them almost two weeks ago, and we canceled. So it was Thursday the 12th, whatever that Thursday was, was the first day of auditions that we officially canceled, and we have not been in the audition room after that. Um, so it's a little bit different. Everything is that being done by self tape right now. Um, but our interactions with the creative team viewing those tapes actually feels really organic and what we're used to um, in that we're getting together on Zoom calls and watching the, the tape. So we'll mute our Zoom. We'll all watch the same tape. We'll unmute Zoom and we'll talk about it, um, which is very much like what the audition room experience is like. We're all viewing what we're viewing and then pausing and reflecting on that and then moving on to the next performer. Um, so that's kind of neat, watching how we've been able to maintain some of those same rhythms and conversations, even though it's all remote. Um, but the rest of our lives, the part of casting and running a business that isn't done in the audition room, for us is all the same. I will say more of my meetings are being done over video. Things that would normally be phone calls are now video calls, um, which is kind of lovely. Uh, and all of those lunches and all of those coffees that I've always wanted to get with all of my colleagues in this industry I'm getting to do a lot more of now um, and so getting to meet some folks that have been sort of on my hit list for quite mm. some time uh, which is lovely I think Allie and I have never been busier we're scheduled almost to the minute all day every day right now uh, in a way that we weren't always when we were sitting at our desks and had some breathing room in our schedules um, I'm hearing it's the opposite of that for other people where most people go to their desks eight hours a day Day and they fill their day and when they go home they're finding they have maybe actually two and a half hours of work and the rest is just sort of fluff when they were in an office and so they're actually being more productive in a short amount of time I actually find that our time's getting filled more mm. at home than at our desk. And so from where you guys sit are productions still happening? Are you guys casting for uncertain dates or for when we all hope life comes back to normal? How are you guys approaching when people will show up to work for all the casting work that you're doing. I 
will let I will let Daryl answer that particular question, but I have I have um, a clarification <laughs> to what uh, Daryl was saying, all of which is true. I think we are busier uh, in terms of networking, um, and I think we are fortunate in terms of projects we have that are still moving forward, and I do believe that is because um, of the time they were initially supposed to go up in. Uh, fortunately, it has not overlapped with what we think this uh, social distancing quarantine time is going to be. Um, and we have a couple of uh, year round theater clients that again, fortunate to just have. What we don't know and where it is slower is in terms of the spring is, has always been historically busy in terms of projects coming to us. So what we're missing out on is stuff we don't know we were going to get to begin with. You know, like I don't know that three feature films weren't going to approach us next week. Uh, and that's kind of the weird unknown. So I would say busy in terms of we're getting a lot of really good networking in that we sometimes have to move around on the calendar quite a bit because when we're all in the office and in person mm. in the city, it's a little bit difficult. But now everyone has all the time in the world to just sit on <laughs> video calls, uh, which is nice. So I would say busy, busy in terms of networking, fortunate in terms of workload. And then there's also just that unknown quantity of like, there is work we would be doing, but it's just invisible to us, you know, because we're not being approached with it, at least not yet, or maybe not at all. You know, we just don't know. Sorry. Okay. Daryl, keep talking. Sure. In terms of timeline, I, again, we were, we've just been very fortunate that a lot of the stuff we knew we were going to be working on now was going to be happening later in the summer. Um, we had one reading that was meant to go up in a month and obviously we pushed it. And the great thing is a lot of the folks we wanted for that reading who weren't available, unfortunately, have actually come back and be like, we're available now if things change. Our production got canceled, our show got pushed, whatever. Uh, so that's been a happy accident that we actually are going back to the original cast we kind of wanted to have at that reading. Um, uh, another show that we're actively in, I don't want to say we're in auditions for, but we're actively reviewing the self-tapes with our creative team. Wasn't going to go up to the tail end of the summer anyway. Um, so we were just getting ahead of the game anyway when we had our audition scheduled and now we're just doing it by itself. tape. We put out a breakdown for a new project this morning, mm. uh, a project that didn't exist to us before the quarantine. And it's a podcast where the performers are going to be able to record their roles at home. They're going to ship them the recording equipment, they'll record it and ship it back and then they'll edit it together. It's a great script. It's a great series. And it was, it did not exist before we were all social distancing. Um, so we're in a little bit of, an, of a nice position, sorry, my phone rang, uh, where we had just some flexibility in our schedule. We had a film that was meant to shoot, you know, they were hoping I may first start. I doubt that's going to happen, but they're flexible and they're nimble and they can push. And again, it looks like we're going to revisit some of the actors who weren't available who now might be. Um, so, so far, I want to like knock cross schedule. Everything has been okay. Uh, things that could move have moved. Um, there may be one or two things that end up falling off just because they lost their theater, they lost the funding, they lost their nerve. Um, but we don't know what those things are yet. I can't imagine they won't be there. Uh, but so far, so good. Um, and we're just pushing forward as best we can. When, when we know that there's an end in sight, it will be full steam ahead. But the good thing is everybody will be full steam ahead. Everyone will be excited to get back to work. Um, and hopefully the actors will all have more open availability. So that's what we're looking for. And the podcast idea sounds phenomenal. What are you allowed or not allowed to tell us in terms of how that project came to your desk? We got an email. The script is great. Yeah. We signed a contract yesterday. So off we go. Good for you. And have you cast a lot of podcasts or? Yeah. One of our, one of our, favorite projects is a podcast called Limetown. Um, we did, it ha it's had two seasons as a podcast. We did both. Uh, it was then picked up by Facebook and they shot um, season one in Canada starring Jessica Biel. Uh, it's wow. a great series. Um, and the collaborator, the creator of it is one of my favorite, favorite humans. So Skip, if you see this, I adore you. He's great. Uh, so yeah, so we, we've done, um, we've been in the fictional audio series space before. 
And you guys were, were talking a lot about self tapes. Uh, I guess people putting themselves on tape. You guys watching them over Zoom. Can you talk a little bit about, it seems like the industry, uh, it's not like self tapes are a new idea to how we cast shows. I know it's not normally the, the norm, but they've certainly been around. Can you talk about how switching to this idea of self tapes over the last few years has sort of primed us to handle casting um, during this crisis a little bit better? And I guess uh, back up for a second, can you just tell us, I think we all know, but just in case anyone watching doesn't know what a self tape is and how an actor would go about doing that? Allie, I'll tell you. Uh, um, sure, I think that, yeah, so self taping is essentially putting the audition in the hands of the actor and having them tape their audition sides that they would have brought into the room with us, but instead they're doing it on their camera or their iPhone or what have you, and then sending it to us, either uploading it directly to our EcoCast on Breakdown Express or sending it via Vimeo or a WeTransfer file, what have you. Um, basically, it has made auditions very, the pros <laughs> of self-taping is it has made auditions very accessible, especially for actors who live in markets outside of New York and Los Angeles. It has made it, uh, so that they can be in places that they are physically not, uh, which is awesome. Um, and we, the industry has, just because as technology does over time, has advanced and is becoming more mainstream, self-taping has become more mainstream, um, and our industry is relying on it quite heavily over the last few over the last few years, again, I think simply because uh, actors are physically existing in one place, yet we are holding auditions physically in another place, and that's where self-taping comes in, um, which has just grown quite a bit. And now, I, I'm, I'm going on a tangent here that is not even making sense. Um, so would you say, um self-taping, the process of self-taping has opened up a brand new world of potential um, uh, applicants is probably the wrong word, but people who are showing up to auditions because you could be casting a Broadway show and looking at talent anywhere in the world. Yes. Yeah, what, what's your craziest story? So someone submits from Hawaii and they're casting a Broadway show. Do you have a crazy story like that? No, I, the, no, the one like great, that's not it, the, the, no. I don't know, Daryl, do you? <laughs> I think, I think the, the upside to, uh, the upside to self-taping uh, in terms of casting is I have been able to, we have actually been able to work in other markets because mm -hmm. of it. I think it has actually expanded our business just like as it, it has expanded business for actors. Um, I've cast, Weirdly, Minneapolis is a big one for us in features, but we've cast several features out of Minneapolis, and I know that acting pool really well now. Um, because That's my hometown. That was intentional, yeah. right? You wanted a shout out to my hometown? I did. I did, Margaret. Um, but that's made it, self-taping has kind of in the sense that social media has pulled the corners of the world a little bit closer together. It's made it so that me quarantining here in Dallas, just again, like the work-life balance, I think self-taping like is part of that larger conversation of, you know, Daniel's able to work outside of DC right now on Broadway projects. Like it is not as big of a deal that I am physically elsewhere when our technology is now to the point where you know, I can be auditioning actors in other places. I can be working on my casting projects from my bedroom in Dallas. Like, that's not an insane idea. Um, sorry, Daryl had something she wanted to add. Oh, just some crazy stories. I do think, like, we have we had, you know, someone who uh, we were able to get in the mix for a show, and she was on tour with a huge uh, pop star and we were able to pull her off that tour and get her into a Broadway show so I mean we have tons of examples of like folks who were not New York based and because we we could self tape them or we had footage of them where they were able to come in on their day off uh, were able to make Broadway debuts 
And um, in terms of if I'm an actor and I'm interested in self-taping, can you talk a little bit about the technology I need on hand? Is it literally just putting up a cell phone? You know, are iPhones good enough? Are iPhone 7s and, and above? Do you need a special microphone, special lighting? What do you guys need to get a good self-tape that's really representative of the person um, who's submitting? Allie. Yeah, sorry. This is why my brain is just all over the place because I actually, <laughs> I'm actually not a fan of self tapes. Um, and I will, I will answer. I will get to that in in my answer to your question. Um, so I would be, I would be remiss if I did not share with actors that it matters to have you know the drop and the box light set. And you can get all of this on Amazon, but having a, a setup with a tripod and, or maybe a ring light, people are into the ring lights, but you know, so you look like you are being uh, filmed in a studio that you would go into for the live audition. Um, that is possible now at home. And, and that is all, again, this is stuff you can find on, on Amazon and there's all kinds of price ranges. Um, I know the ring light, the LED like ring light is really popular for self tapes. You look excellent. Um, mm. and then some people like getting a real professional drop if they don't have a blank wall in their home. Now this is where <laughs> I start to have problems with some of the self tape culture we'll call it that we are transitioning into and this is more i will say it's more of a problem in tv and film than it is in theater um i think self-taping is great for theater because again we're able to get that person on tape and in the mix for a show when they're on the road and we're casting in the room in new york right theater is live so like it's it's pretty difficult to outright lose that live element of it altogether um but just if we can pivot and speak about the self-tape culture in TV and film for a second, what I don't like is self-taping is starting to replace pre-screening. Um, I see a lot of casting offices doing it. I see a lot of projects doing it where, um, you know, the first round is, is pre-screens, send us your self-tapes, or projects are casting entirely based off of self-tape to lower the overhead cost, which is great for producers, but now we are asking actors in a way to pay to audition, and I don't like that. As somebody who's married to an actor, we're now asking the actors, we're, we're handing that overhead expense to them, and I have a little bit of an ethical issue with that. It's like now we're asking them to invest in this equipment that's not cheap, or you know, there are now businesses that you can go to a studio and have your um, audition professionally shot. You know, you shell out 20 bucks or whatever, and you know, they'll give you a reader, they'll give you the whole works and you get yourself tape like professionally made. And um, that's, that's fine and well, but not everybody has access to those resources or has money to invest in all of this equipment. And um, when we, hold session as we typically do that puts all of the actors on the same you know uh level same playing field um and uh i had one more point i had one more point <laughs> but anyway it, it's just it's not equitable and um so i think there is a certain line we're kind of teetering on like i'm a big fan of self tapes when it is i'm getting to see somebody who absolutely cannot come in the room that's when I love it it's like yes this has made this accessible for us when I don't love it is when I think we are uh abusing it a little bit and I'm seeing people in the industry abuse it oh my other point was sorry 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 and you're not these people because you are great um but the the people you don't who need can, to flatter us just because we're hosting this no no I, I really mean that I really mean that but um I have seen producers from, from our side of things uh, watch self-tapes and pick the actor who has the, the really well-produced self-tape because it looks studio quality when somebody else who maybe is like out of town doing a regional show and they just kind of set up their iPhone in their hotel room, but maybe has the better chops, has the better tape, but they are, I, I have seen people get brain tricked mm. into thinking that the higher quality tape 
is the better actor. And it's like, no, that person just had more money <laughs> like to set up a, to set up a self tape space. Um, so I don't know. I have a lot, I have a lot of feelings about it and now you know them all. So I'm yeah, going to show no, you. Thank you. <laughs> well, and jumping off of that a little bit where, what I don't know, because I have not worked behind the scenes at a casting directing shop, um, your relationship with the producer versus the director versus the choreographer. Can you speak to that a little bit? Besides, it depends. I would, I'm very curious what those relationships look like on various projects. Daryl, wait, wait. She was on mute. Okay, I was on mute and I couldn't unmute myself, but here I, I am. Now I can, okay. <laughs> Great. Um, okay, so unfortunately, yes, it does depend. Sorry, Margaret. Uh, on any project, the hope is there's one person who's steering that ship. Um, usually it is the director, um, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's the writer. Sometimes it's the producer. Sometimes it ends up being the choreographer in some examples. Um, the hope is there is one leader and the buck stops with them, or at least the vision comes from them. And then our hope is, is that's the direct line of communication we're going to have. Uh, it can get really tricky on projects where there is no clear captain where the producer is, is very creatively involved and perhaps the director isn't given um, enough freedom to own the space and to own um, the vision or to be the, the touch point. Um, something that I love about casting is we are in a very precious moment of the production where we get a lot of the hypothetical, the theoretical, the planning and the transition to the physical production, to the reality, to the like, okay, we wrote words on a page and really anyone could say them, but no, now specifically one person must say them. Um, that transition, casting's right, in, right at that spark of creation in the middle of it. I love that, but it also means we are generally the first moment where creative team members are all sitting in a room together being asked to collaborate. So part of what our job is, is to help make sure that is a healthy collaboration and to help figure out how they're gonna collaborate with each other and whose voice isn't being heard that needs to be heard or whose voice are we listening to too, too much, but it's drowning out somebody else's. Um, so something we have to very quickly figure out is who is the sign off, right? Like who's, a, who's the final approval on the breakdown? Who's the final approval on the sides? Who is um, approving the amount of days in the room? Uh, sometimes it's the GM, sometimes it's the producer, sometimes it's the director, sometimes it's the music director. Like there's always gonna be someone who ultimately ends up being the captain of that ship. We hope it's not us, it shouldn't be us. Um, and if it is us, we, we have a problem. Um, but I've seen many projects get very strange very quickly when mm. that leader's not clearly defined. Um, but the joy of what we get to do is help um, lead by example and, and help set them off onto a healthy collaboration. Um, and so maintaining professionalism and respect and kindness in the casting process sets up a creative team, I think, for the rest of that, that production. Um, but our hope is there is a clearly defined visionary and that everybody else on the creative team recognizes that singular vision. It's very hard to tell many people's stories. We usually need to tell it all through one person's eyes. And can you talk a little bit about how um, throughout, as the casting process gets closer and closer to actually picking your final cast, how who is in the room for audition, auditions changes? Because I think people might assume like it's just you guys the entire way, but at a certain point, um, there can be quite a few people in the room as well. Sure, yeah. Generally, if we're having what we would call a pre-screen or what some people would just call audition, uh, it will generally just be a member of the casting team, the casting director specifically, in the world of me and Allie, me or Allie, um, or both, will be the ones who are sort of first line of defense uh, at the top of that funnel, you'll be meeting with casting. Then it will start to narrow, the funnel will narrow down in terms of people, but the seats behind the table will grow. Uh, and sometimes the next round is music director, or the next round is just the director, or the director and the choreographer. Uh, until the point where you get to final callbacks, and that could be the producers, the writer, um, the estate, if you're dealing with a uh, revival, um, music director, music associate, choreographer, associate choreographer, assistant director, director. I mean, we've had 
costumes and some examples there. Um, the, we had the all kinds of people in the room at the final round, haven't we? Yeah, sometimes they just get slapped the label of producer, but it's actually somebody's, you know, adult child. child who's visiting or not adult child who's visiting. We like to be respectful that we are in a job interview. And so those who are getting to adjudicate said job interview are those who are decision makers in the process. Um, if someone's voice is not really going to be heard at the decision making table, then they shouldn't be in the audition room. Um, I would like to, to hold that line. We're not always in control of who gets to come in the door. Um, producers often will, uh, as a treat, like to bring investors in or, you know, we get what we do. It's sexy. It's fun. Uh, but it's still someone's job interview. And so we like to draw a hard line. If you're not going to get to weigh in on this person getting the job, you don't get to watch this person get the job. Um, How do you control the atmosphere in the room so that someone who's coming into audition and there's 20 people sitting behind the table aren't so freaked out that they can't give you their best work that day? That's why we hope not to have 20 people behind the table. It's also going to be really hard to make a decision with 20 people in the room to come to the answer without having strong leadership from the creative team. Um, I like to, at the very least, give like a little seating chart in the, hall, the hallway or the holding room so that when people come in, they know exactly who is everybody, what is their title, what are the roles. Um, that's, I think, like the kindest thing we can do. So at least uh, they're, they're not walking into a sea of strangers. But my hope is to keep the room as intimate as possible as long as possible. I love that idea. That's something that you do as um, as as your casting agency or that's what ev everyone does? We like to do that. Um, yeah. I don't know that I, everyone does, but I think it's a best practice. Okay. Yeah. Just We're, curious. That's, it's phenomenal. Yeah. Now, can you talk to us a little about the process? So you've gone through the auditions, you've had the initial, initial auditions, you're in callbacks, you've got you guys, the creative team, the producers. Talk to me a little bit about some of the, um, back and forth conversations that you have when you're trying to select the best person for the part. Um, are there situations sometimes where you guys feel very strongly, it should be one person, um, but the creative team sees it a different way. And what's the give and take in those conversations? Mm. Are you pointing at me? Yeah. Do you want to take it? If not, I can dive in. Uh, you, you dive in first, you dive in first. Okay. Honestly, our hope is that we are not sitting in there clashing with our creative teams. The hope is that we've had enough of a healthy collaboration to get to the point of, let's call it final callbacks, where we all have the same vision and we're working towards the same goal. Um, the first conversation we ever have with a creative team ever on anything is about um, inclusive casting. And so at some point, as we get to those final decisions, we're going to make sure and touch base that the conversation we had initially about inclusive casting are we holding true to that vision and to that goal. Um, so that will always come up in conversation just to, to hold ourselves accountable. Uh, but I never want to be in conflict with my creative team. Um, and to be fair, even if I was like, look, I know this person, I know they, they can't handle this, but they can handle, hopefully all of that will have been part of the conversation well before the final trigger gets pulled. If there was someone I felt was just a, not someone I felt was a worthy collaborator, the chance of them being in the room that far into it would be fairly low. Um, I don't want to bring somebody into the room that I can't um, give my, you know, my seal of approval on that. Yes, they're going to be great on set. Yes, they're going to be great in the rehearsal room. Yes, this is an artist you want to collaborate with. If I can't say that, why would I be bringing them into the room just because they can hit that note or you know, kick their legs that high. Um, it's about hiring the whole person because we'll get to see their performance, but we have to be in the production process with them as a human being as well. And so those two things need to both be there. So that was a very long answer to the, we are generally not the decision makers, but our hope is that we are all speaking the same language and working towards the same vision, that there isn't a conflict um, in the adjudication process. Yeah, what about this? And just to push you on that for a moment, or has have there ever been a time where you guys felt so strongly that somebody should be in the role and nobody else really saw it, but you guys pushed and pushed and said, trust us on this. We know this person, we see them in it, and you're standing there on opening night, and the director, the producer comes up to you and says, Daryl, Allie, 
thank you. We could not, we were not going to do this if it weren't for you. And this show would not be what it is if had you guys not pushed to have this person in the part. Uh, usually, yes. Um, our hope is that that's not the conversation. Again, our hope is, is that when we made the hiring decision, everybody was on board and excited about it. But we, we'd certainly advocate for the people we want to advocate for that we truly have faith in that we believe would do justice to the piece. Um, I had a conversation with the writer director. And again, we, we were having strong conversations about inclusive casting and diversity on the stage. And I fought hard, really fought hard for it. And uh, we hired that, like we, we made that commitment and we stuck to it. And after the piece was over, the writer director was like, you know what, thank you. Thank you for reminding me to, to hold my feet to the fire on this because it was the right thing to do. And then after it knocked it out of the park. And so, yes, uh, same examples of like people who made their Broadway debuts of folks that we fought hard for, our alley fought hard for, we advocated for. We didn't bring them in for callbacks, but we're like, you know what, let's just see them one more time. And that was who we, we hired and, and they soared in the roles. I, I think, yeah, my... My addition to all of this is um, it also it also really depends on like uh, what the process was like up until that point and folding back in kind of like the self tape things. I'm thinking specifically about working on a show where we did have people who came in multiple times, multiple times, multiple times, and we were like this, 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 and then a great self tape came in <laughs> and the team fell in love with it. And there is a weird balance of like okay. They're really happy with what they're seeing in this tape, but also like we've had this person in the room six times. They've knocked it out of the park every time, and just kind of weighing that like, what do we what do we push for? Mm -hmm. um, and then I think process in terms of I'm thinking again specifically about a project uh, where we were we were casting off of tapes and you know, determining how I push based on like what I'm seeing in this tape and what I know from knowing that actor and what they bring to the table live in a room or in a show because I've seen them in things. And that's again, like kind of why the live aspect of live theater is so important. Um, getting in the room with actors and just like, it's not really my place to be like, actually, I think you should hire this person. But, you know, there is a you know, a, a true balance there. Uh, and Daryl and I have both crossed that line, <laughs> I think. But you have to, again, you have to, you have to cross it when you feel like it is appropriate. Uh, and I only ever cross it when I know this is the solution. I have the solution. I have the solution and I'm okay to die on this hill. That is when I'm like, y'all need to listen to me. It is this person I know because drop resume or whatever but i'm going on another tangent now no i love it well and, and you're making me think so much about inclusive casting and it's not just about having that conversation at the beginning you need to also have it in the middle and at the end and something daniel and i talk about so often is representation inclusivity on our side of the business so i mean i'm staring at two women who run a business I mean, what, what is that like as two women? How do you guys make sure that there's representation behind the table? Can you, can you chat to that a little bit? There are some times on projects where we are the only women on the creative team at all. Um, and that's difficult. And we're not always necessarily seen that way. Oh, that we're not even seen to be on the creative team? I don't know what you're saying, Allie. That's what I'm saying. Right. Well, we're the only women in the room at all. Uh, and casting not being considered part of the creative team is another conversation for another day. Uh, casting does not get the recognition that it deserves ever. Like there'll be press releases on Playbill about the cast and they'll list the lighting designer, but not the casting director. Um, but uh, we need to do better about representation everywhere, uh, but creative teams especially. Um, casting's interesting. And we've been finding this more and more over the course of the past decade and a half that casting is getting brought onto the process earlier and earlier and earlier, sometimes before a director, sometimes before a writer. Um, and so we're getting to be included on producerial conversations that we used to not be included on a decade ago or, or two decades ago. Um, 
which is wonderful and certainly like lights the fire in the parts of my brain and Allie's brain that are producerially bent. Um, but I would say one out of every three projects, we get asked for what directors do we like or what GMs do we like or um, what choreographers do we like, what music directors do we like. And we've made it a point to make sure that the recommendations we are giving are diverse um, and inclusive. And, you know, I, I will say this right now for film, I haven't sent a list of film directors that I, or, or any director that I like that isn't a female or person of color in like two years. Like I just, that's just who's on the list of the people that I'm sending around. Um, so strange that in the world of casting, we actually are having any sort of input on those conversations, but when we get asked for it, my goodness, do we speak up? Um, we're one of the shows we're casting right now. The woman who's directing is because they asked us for what directors do you like? And she was on our list. Um, and now we get to work with her again and it's wonderful and we adore her. Uh, but we have, a. I, I am proud to say that we are a, female owned casting office, but it's still bizarre that that's somehow is also a still a selling point of our company that we're a female owned casting office. Uh, we are a kick-ass casting office first and a female casting office second. I have shivers. Thank you. Just curious. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so we have just a few minutes before we get kicked off of Zoom and we have at least one question from uh, our live audience today. So let me ask this question. Um, so I, I forget, I don't have this person's name, but uh, this person asks, so if you're someone outside of a market, what's the best way to get your self tape into your hands as a casting director? If they don't have management as actors, where are the opportunities for outsiders to get their material seen? She, she wants me to answer it. Yeah, so we work in a, we work in a bunch of different markets. Um, best, some of these answers uh, are, are some of these questions we've been getting on our Instagram live quite a bit too. Uh, so I, I preface it with some of these answers won't be what you want to hear because I think a lot of the time we want like a, a fast and easy uh, solution. Those don't exist. This is a difficult business. <laughs> it's difficult to break into. It's difficult to do. Um, I'm not going to pretend that's not the case. So I preface all of this with that. And that being said, the best way to get on my radar is to audition for me. And I know there is a catch 22 to that. It's because, well, then you have to get an audition, but uh, open calls, looking at breakdowns, being on actors access, making sure you're doing everything in your power uh, to be in control of the very few things you have control over. So that's making sure um, that we're big on, uh, I should be able to Google your name and find your website. It should be one of the top hits. I, and on that, all I need is your picture, resume, and a way to contact you. That's that's big. Um, and that's a big step in getting on our radar and being accessible for us to then give you auditions or give you self-tape opportunities. Um, part of living in a market, was that part of the question too? They're in an outside market. Again. Yeah, if they're outside the market. Uh, I think it speaks to globally how they get your on your radar, but particularly mm -hmm. if they're outside of the market. Outside of them, okay. So they're not living in like a regional market, but just outside of the business, trying to break into the business in general. I follow. Um, classes are huge, and again, like I'm talking about things that are privilegy. <laughs> I am acknowledging that, like. Um, we try, Daryl and I try really hard, and I know some other casting directors do as well, to make ourselves accessible, make sure we're also doing things that are free of charge, um, networking events, and the Instagram lives, and um, if we can, we try to release breakdowns on our website, that way there is a free way to see the breakdown and submit to us. We can't on every single project, obviously, because there are some that, you know, we have to be signing NDAs for and whatnot, or the creators want that privacy and that's understood. But when we can, we try to make that information available to, um, to actors directly. Uh, we have unique uh, email submissions for each of our projects so that you can always self-submit on, on those. So we, we, we try really, really hard to um, make ourselves accessible for you to get on our radar, but then it's the, you know, actually us biting 
and inviting you in. That is, I get it, a bit of a catch-22. So the best way to meet us is to audition for us. Uh, and that can also mean EPAs, ECCs, required calls, being on top of those, making sure you're reading the trades and going in and meeting every single casting director possible. Yeah, and the great thing uh, of this moment, as strange as it is, is that all EPAs are being done with digital submissions right now. So if you are outside this market, guess what? Uh, you are being uh, put in the mix for every single EPA in every single city anywhere. Um, we're about to be releasing our EPAs for, that would have been in LA and Dallas and New York City, and it's all digital, which means you can be in Chicago or Miami or Seattle or you know, Indonesia, and you can still submit now for the EPA. So take where, advantage where can of that. I find those? Uh, the, the EPAs get posted on Playbill. They get posted on uh, Actors Equity's website. Uh, I think Broadway World does listings. They're everywhere. Um, we certainly tweet every time there's anything about anything we're working on anywhere or any Zoom or anything. Um, and one last plug, Ali and I, to make ourselves accessible, especially in this weird time where everyone's got some time on their hands, Every Monday to Friday, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 11 a.m. Pacific Time, Allie and I are going live on Instagram. EB Casting Co. Uh, is our Instagram handle. E like Eisenberg, B like Beans, Casting like what we do, Co like Company, Incomes Company. Uh, that's our Instagram handle. And we shoot the shit for so 2, p.m. Out. 2 p.m. every afternoon, Monday to Friday, for the foreseeable future. You two, Instagram Live. Yes. At EB Casting Co. Yes. I love it. And then on Twitter, at EB Cast and Co., all of the audition announcements. Yep. Amazing. Well, Daryl, Allie, thank you so much for making time for us this afternoon. You two seem incredibly busy. We're glad to hear you're still busy. We're glad to hear you can still conduct auditions during this time. Um, and for everyone, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, you can ask us questions. Is there anyone else you want to hear on future editions of KGM Connects? Uh, hashtag us at Ask KGM Connects. Ha ask KGM Connects. It's a bit of a tongue twister. Um, Margaret? Oh, thank you both. Allie and Daryl, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Guys, everyone, please be safe. Stay safe. Social distancing. Yeah, wash your hands. Hi, y'all. Self-tapes. <laughs>